So we'll continue with our look at synovial joints. Um, now, we talked about the movements that can happen at synovial joints, and really those movements happen because of the shapes of the joints, the structure of the joint. And so we look at, at, at the six different types of structures or shapes of the joint surfaces that allow certain motions and allow um, and disallow other motions. So those are plane, hinge, pivot, condyloid, saddle, and ball and socket. Now, the plane joints are flat surfaces. They have what are called facets. And because the two surfaces are flat, the only thing that can happen between them is a gliding motion. Uh, and the gliding motions are limited by the ligaments that, that cross the joint, by the joint capsule. So they tend to be fairly short gliding motions, but non-axial gliding motions, flat surfaces. They slip past one another. So, it, so the intercarpal joints are an example of that. Um, they, they allow that slipping and sliding. The facet joints of the spine, the, the posterior joints of the spine, are plane joints. Anytime you see the word facet, it probably means that there is there is gliding going to happen there, and it, and the joint is a plane joint. Hinge joints allow motions in a single plane, so they're uniaxial. They they allow flexion and extension, um, just like. A hinge of a door only allows the door to swing open and shut. It doesn't allow the the any changes of angles between the door frame and the door itself, and it's because of the hinges. And hinges tend to have some sort of a barrel and a pin that holds them. So it tends to be some sort of a, an articulating surface that is round and cylindrical together so that the cylinder fits into kind of the trough of the uh, of the other bone so in the elbow here between the ulna right, and the trochlea of the humerus is a hinge joint and and your elbow at this between the ulna and the humerus, the only thing that can happen is flexion and extension. Um, now, there are other joints such as the knee that are modified hinge joints that allow certain other motions, but their primary motion is flexion and extension. This is a pure hinge joint. The, the joints between uh, the phalanges, the the proximal interphalangeal and the distal interphalangeal are hinge joints. They only allow flexion and extension. And that's because the one bone forms kind of a trough and the other bone forms kind of a cylinder that, that rotates in that trough, that, that hinges in it, as, as it were. So pivot joints are joints that allow rotation. Uh, so they tend to have the rounded end of one bone fits in the sleeve or ring of the other bone. Uh, so it would be things like this. So somehow it pivots. Uh, at the proximal radio ulna joint, the ulna here has got a a ligament that goes completely around the head of the radius called the annular ligament, annular, once around, and it allows rotation to happen there. The, the uh, joint between C1 and C2, the atlas and the axis, the odontoid process, the dens of, the, of C2, is surrounded by either the bone or the ligament of C1, the transverse ligament of C1, that allows this pivoting motion, this rotation motion. <coughs> You'll notice that the angle doesn't sh change shape. 
At the distal radio ulnar joint, there's also a pivoting uh, motion happens, but it's it's done slightly differently. The uh, radius is joined onto a, a process on the ulna, uh, and it uh, and it swings around uh, the same way as in that movie Singing in the Rain, the dancer swings around um, the lamp post. Now, the next type of joint is actually a condylar joint, but I would rather do the, um, the ball and socket joint first. So I'm going to drop down to the ball and socket joint because it makes more sense. And then we'll modify this to make the condylar and the saddle joint. So a ball and socket joint is just what it, you'd think it is. There's a ball and there's a socket that the ball sits in. And because the ball is the same in all directions, it's a sphere, and the socket is the same in all directions, it allows multi-axial movement. You can, you can rotate it medially and laterally. You can flex it and extend it. You can ab and adduct it. So this is the one that allows the most motion. It also tends to be the least stable, but we'll, the, that's a whole other discussion. And, and the reason that it works is because the socket is the same in all dimensions and the the sphere of the the head is the same in all dimensions at least on the articular surface of the dimensions now if this head was not in fact spherical but more of an ellipse so more oval so that it was different uh, along one surface than along the other then that ovalness would um, allow all the angular motions, so it would allow flexion, extension, ab and adduction, circumduction, but it wouldn't allow any rotation because as you started to rotate, the, the larger surface would have to fit into the smaller part of the socket. So it's basically exactly like a ball and socket except the surfaces are oval and uh, and motion is limited to the the um, to the angular motions so we get this in the metacarpal phalangeal joint you can flex extend ab and adduct circumduct but you can't rotate this is more common actually than the ball and socket uh, the hinge joints all have collateral ligaments so they don't ab and adduct uh, the condyloid joints might have uh, collateral ligaments but usually don't um, and if they do they tend to be loose so that you can get this circumduction motion if you can circumduct the joint it's either a ball and socket, a condyloid, or a saddle joint. Now, a saddle joint is, is very much like a condyloid joint in its range of motion. But the problem is with a condyloid joint, like when you go back to look at a condyloid joint, the problem is that you can see that it would be easily dislocated, that depending on the depth of the socket, you would be able to slip out the like the phalange would be able to move backwards on the on the um, metacarpal here if you would say we're catching a ball it doesn't matter because we tend to use these four fingers together so the the joints kind of reinforce each other and so we can get away with a condyloid joint here uh, we, where there's lots of muscle or there's lots of flesh, condyloid joints work. 
but where there's not a lot of flesh, where we still have to have that motion, but the poor joint is out on its own, like say right here, uh, then uh, we have to stop the possibility of a dislocation. And we do that with a saddle joint. And a saddle joint is fits together just like your body fits on a saddle. Now, you will notice that um, each articular surface has a concave and a convex area in at right angles to one another. So if you look at your body, you are convex from your crotch to your bum around the underside of you, and you are concave from one thigh to the next, kind of through your crotch. Uh, so on the, on the frontal plane, your body is, uh, has a concavity, and on the sagittal plane, going through your crotch, your body has a convexity. A saddle, from the pommel to the back of the saddle, uh, is concave to fit the convexity of your crotch. And then from stirrup to stirrup across the, the back of the saddle, the saddle is convex to fit your concavity. And when you're sitting on a saddle, you can flex forward, you can extend back, and you can ab and adduct, but you can't rotate. Uh, and it's the same thing. So we use these joints where we want to be able to flex, extend, ab, adduct, circumduct, but we want an extra protection against dislocation. And that's what the, why the stirrups are on the saddle. It prevents you from falling off the horse. Um, it, it prevents dislocation. So classic place to have it is at the metacarpal carpal joint of uh, your thumb at the trapezium and the in the first metacarpal uh, it's a saddle joint because it has to have that motion but your thumb sits out there all by itself and would be prone to injury another place that it that we have a saddle joint is at the sternoclavicular joint uh, where the sternum meets the clavicle because you want to be able to flex extend ab and adduct and circumduct that joint but you don't want the clavicle to dislocate and push back and sever your jugular vein and your carotid artery and all the nerves going to your arm probably not a healthy thing to do so that's another place where there's a saddle joint